I was always more interested in software that was super easy to use. Configuration should be simple to do and the installation should be even easier. For these reasons, I found myself gravitating to Zerto for a disaster recovery solution. This video will walk you through the installation, configuration, and failover of some test virtual machines. To get started, we'll run the installer that we've downloaded from the internet. Make sure to run it as an administrator if you're on a Windows machine with user access control enabled. On the first screen, we'll get an overview of uh, Zerto Virtual Replication. We'll click Next. We will diligently read through this end user licensing agreement and accept the license agreement. Click Next. Decide where we're going to install Zerto. And then we're going to use a custom installation so that we can see all the pieces that are happening. Requires a Windows service. We're going to use the local system account. And we're also going to need a database. The recommended version is the embedded database that will be installed with the installer. Then we enter in our vCenter connectivity. So this is the production site. So we'll put in our production vCenter server and some credentials that can connect to that machine. We have the option for using vCloud Director, but we are not using that in this demo. And then we have to enter in some information for the Zerto Virtual Manager site. So we're going to call this the production site. We're going to give it a location, which is our production location and some contact information. The next screen shows us the IP addresses and the ports that will be needed on this machine. Click Next. And it will go through a validation screen to make sure that all of our ports are open and that we've met all of our requirements. At the end we can click Run. And this will take us through the rest of the installation. I'll speed up the installer to get us to the end here. At this point I'm going to delete our installer files and I'm going to go repeat this process at a virtual machine in our DR site. And I'll connect that installation with our DR vCenter. Once this is done we'll open up the Zerto virtual replication icon and we'll go to enter into a username and password that's, that comes from our vCenter. At this point, we'll need to enter in a license key. And then on our DR site, we can click the second option to pair a site with a license. Now that we've gotten logged into the console, you'll see that we've got a message saying to install VRAs to enable replication. To do this, we'll click the Setup tab to deploy our virtual replication appliances. Here we'll need to install an appliance for every one of our ESXi hosts that are going to replicate virtual machines to the DR site. In this case, I've only got a single host called Workload2. And I'm going to enter in some credentials for that ESXi host. I'm going to select a data store to place the VRA disks on. I'm going to select a network that the replication will take place on. I'm going to select the amount of RAM, which I'm going to leave to default. And you can set up VRA groups so that they replicate differently. Next, I'm going to give the VRA some IP information. When I'm done, we'll click Install. You'll notice we've got a running task going now that says Installing VRA. Again, you'll need to repeat this process in the DR site as well for any hosts that might be handling replication traffic from our production site. Again, I'll speed up time here. Once this is complete, we'll want to set up some repositories to store additional backup data. Here I've logged into the DR site, and I've gone to set up, and I click New Repository. We'll give the repository a name, and we'll select the SMB share which we'll store this data. I'm entering in some credentials, and then I'm entering in our file path. At this point, we'll click Validate to make sure that everything is all right. And then we have free space, and then you can enable compression, and you can set it as the default repository if you want to have more than one. 
just a second, it'll say connected. Now that that's out of the way, we can go set up a VPG. The VPG is a virtual protection group and it's used to show how virtual machines will fail over to the other site. We'll give the VPG a name and we'll select a priority in case you have more than one. Then we'll have to select our virtual machines. I've got an important VM that we're going to use te to test. Then we set up replication. We'll choose the recovery site. We'll also choose a host or a vSphere cluster. This is where the virtual machine will live when it fails over. We'll also choose a data store where the data for that virtual machine will live after it's been replicated. We can select our journal history, how long in the past we can go back to recover data. And we'll set an RPO alert, which is set to five minutes by default. We'll also set a test reminder to make sure that we're reminded that we need to run our test periodically. For WAN compression, you should leave that enabled unless you have some sort of other WAN compression or acceleration tool in use. If we click VM settings, we can go into each one of the virtual machines that we've selected for our virtual protection group, and we can edit their settings so that some of those virtual machines can have different settings. For instance, maybe some of them live on a different cluster or some of them need to live in a different data store. We can set those individually. Next, we can do the storage, the same thing we've done for the replication. And then in the recovery section, we can determine what networks that the virtual machines will fail over to for both a test failover as well as a real failover. We'll select a virtual machine folder. And then there's the options to run scripts during the failover process. Now we can set the networking information for each of our virtual machines. Notice here we can set IP address information for both a failover slash move as well as a test scenario. We do this because in some situations when you fail over a virtual machine to the DR site, you may want it to be on a different network which has different IP schemes than the test network. For instance, since a test fails over and doesn't turn off the original virtual machine at the production site, you may have it spin up in a different network that's isolated. But in order for it to communicate, you still have to set IP addresses. When the machine fails over, VMware Tools is used to update the virtual machine IP addresses. Notice here I'm entering information only for the failover slash move so that I've got a different IP address range at the DR site. But we can copy that if we want the settings to be the same for both a move and a test. Next, we can set up whether or not we're going to use backups. This uses that additional repository we set up at the DR site. And we can set how long the retention period is going to be, which re repo we're going to use, and when to run the jobs. Just like with replication, we can set a script to run after a backup job as well. Review the summary, and then click Done. You'll see a running task shows up, and then we're creating the VPG. Now when we go back to the dashboard after our VPG has been created, we can see that an initial sync is taking place. So replication is now happening between our production and our DR site. Let's run a test. Notice in the bottom right hand corner we've got an option for both a live or a test scenario. Click failover on the test scenario. We'll select our VPG. We can add any execution parameters such as boot order or scripts that will be handled on that VPG. And then we review our test from the production site to the DR site. And we'll click start failover. We'll see a new running task. 
and the failover test is started. Once the test is started, we'll open both our virtual centers in both the production site as well as the DR site, and we can see what's happening. You'll notice that the important VM that we're testing our failover on will never be turned off at the production site. A new virtual machine called Important VM Testing Recovery will be created at the DR site and powered on. Once the machine is powered on, you'll be able to open the console and see exactly what's happening. If you've chosen to change any IP addresses during the failover, you may notice that the machine will reboot one time after it's been brought up to change the IP address settings. But then if we log in through the console, we can see exactly the exact same virtual machine that we saw on the production site. You'll get a warning noti noting that this is a DR test machine and it's not recommended to make changes on it. We can still log in to see what's happening. If we look at the network settings, we should be able to see that the IP address has been changed based on the IP address we gave it in the VPG, which it has. If we go back to our management console, we'll see that a failover test has completed and we, are, we have the ability to stop the test whenever we're done testing. So we stop the test and we need to log a result of either success or a failure. In this case, we'll say success. And we can enter any notes if we need to. And the test will stop. Once we begin the stopping the test, if we look in our vCenter again, we'll see that the virtual machine at the DR site gets powered off and removed from inventory. The whole time the important VM at the production site is still running. Now it's time for us to do a real test. To do that we can switch it over to live and we'll click failover again just like we did with our test scenario. Again we'll select our VPG, modify any execution parameters, In this case, we're going to reverse protection. And what that does is once the machine fails over to the DR site, it'll start replicating it again in the reverse direction back towards the production site. Review and click Start Failover. We'll see running tasks begin again, just as we did with our test. And we'll see changes starting to happen in our DRV center first. The virtual machine will be powered on, and this time, since it's a failover, any machines in the production site that were failed over will also be powered off and removed from inventory. We're now committing the failover. And we'll notice that the machine in the production site has been powered off and now has been removed from inventory. And the machine at our DR site has now become our production machine. You can see we're still failing it over. There are still a few processes that happen. And then once this is completed, we'll see an initial sync happen again. This is the replication in the reverse direction so that we are able to fail back to the production site when we're ready. There's a lot of things that have to happen to fail your site over during a disaster, but they shouldn't have to be complicated.